I want to get right into it, and I want to appreciate you coming on, um, taking the time to do this, because I'm sure you're probably busier now more than ever, and yeah, I, I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Thank you. So, I'm so excited to chat. Yeah, and uh, I want to tell people, who is Jessica Glazier? Yeah, so I am a business coach, first and foremost. I help people, specifically coaches, build online businesses. And uh, I am a former celebrity personal trainer, former elementary school phys ed teacher, kind of lived a bunch of different lives, but that is who I am, mostly. <laughs> That's great. And how did you transition from being a physical ed teacher to the online space? How did that happen? So it was funny, actually, I taught phys ed for eight years. And all the while was a, was a trainer. I've actually been a trainer since 2002. So it's been 18 years working as a personal trainer. It sort of was always just like a side hustle type of thing that I did on the side of school. In 2013, 2014, I got into bodybuilding. And when I was competing, my coach lived in a different state from me. And I was paying her for essentially emails that she would send me my workouts and my macros. And so I had this like light bulb moment, I could do that too, right? I had worked as a trainer. So I started doing that and emailed workout plans turned into low ticket items, turned into paid Facebook groups, challenges, eBooks, so on and so forth. And then in 2017, I realized that really was where a lot of my excitement and passion was lying was in impacting more people and being my own boss. And so I took the leap. I left my job as a teacher. I in no way was making some sort of a living that it was easy to leave my job, but I did and built the kind of cute side hustle to a multiple six figure business, at which point a lot of my fitness friends here in New York City were asking me, how do I make my money? How do I do things online? What am I always doing behind the computer? And so in November 2018, I started just kind of quietly helping a bunch of my fitness friends here in New York. One friend turned into three turned into six every Thursday at noon, we were sitting around my laptop. And I was like, I think I need to charge you guys for this. <laughs> um, and so in November 2018, business coaching really was born accidentally, I was able to take my once again, kind of cute side hustle to a million dollar business. And at this point, we've helped over just about 200 people build out their own personal training, health, fitness, and now otherwise businesses online. So I actually work with any type of coach, really, but um, it's definitely heavy, heavy handed in the fitness industry, for sure. Wow. That is a whirlwind. Let me start off <laughs> with you have this, it sounds like insane desire to want more right? Mm, um, I yeah. think you referred to two things that caught my attention. It was one, it was the number of impacted people you started helping in your circle. Yep. Um, and then you started reaching out to others because you realized this is a service that is far beyond my own people. Yeah. Um, and sometimes people confuse that with saying like, how can I charge my friends? Mm. And is that the right thing to do? Um, and I want to talk to the people now who are making that transition in the fitness space, yeah. or let's say, anything really to the online world. How do you go about figuring out that right service for your friends versus the people, right? Like you could say to yourself, am I taking advantage of my friends versus I'm not taking care of myself. Yeah. Because as you said, you were spending those Thursday nights with your friends helping them. But then you're like, all right, what am I getting out of this? And it's not being selfish. No. But it's more so it's your time. Yeah. And you can't get that back. Yeah. So how do you, how would you advocate for someone who's dealing with that right now, understanding I'm dedicating my time on the, the online space and I'm helping out my friends, but how do I take that next level? How do I charge my friends if I charge my friends? Yeah, I love this. And then how do I find the right people to, you know, come into my services of whatever it may be? It's such a good question, you know, and we see this all the time. Like I'm currently seeing this with my clients right now. I offer a signature 12 week program. We're right in between week six and seven right now when they're doing a lot of the selling and the question keeps coming up of like, should I just give it to my friends and family for free? So the thing here that I've learned after investing in myself over and over and over is people who pay, pay attention. Like period, people who pay, pay attention. And that's why for any of the listeners on here, if you can think for a moment of some of those, you know, free downloads that you've gotten, those PDFs, those workouts, the um, even the apps that we use, even the apps that we buy for like $1.99, I challenge you to think about how often do you actually open the app? So if we're going to talk about fitness for a second, let's go with the big box gym. There's nothing wrong with these gyms, but let's go with the, you know, $10 a month or $20 a month. So the Planet Fitness, LA Fitness, something like that. 
And then let's look at the more uh, boutique style gyms that are $200 a month. You know, we're in New York City. There, there are studios here. I work at one that's, you know, $400 a month. Which one do you think you'd be more inclined to roll over and hit the snooze button for? We're going to roll over and hit the snooze button, like without even second guessing ourselves for 10 or $20 a month. But when you're paying 200, 400, something like that, that snooze button is going to sting, right? You're not going to hit the snooze button because you're like, I'm paying for this. I've invested in this. I want to get the most out of it. So understand that it's for you and your friend who might be a client. You want to make sure that they get the most out of it. And you, the coach, the trainer, the leader, the teacher, you want to give someone the best experience possible. So it's only fair. Money simply is an exchange of energy. Like that's sales is just an exchange of energy. And so like you said, you want to be compensated. It's not so much about the dollar amount, but it's my time. And when we think about time and I think about the things that I've learned, it's not necessarily the certification. I've spent years, literally a decade honing my craft and reading books and going to events and investing in other coaches. That's what you're paying for. And so I think that people who pay, pay attention. And I truly believe that it actually is a better um, kind of agreement between you and a friend or you and a family member, if there is payment involved, because at that point, then maybe there's also a real contract involved, which there should be. And there needs to be clear expectations and clear boundaries about what this looks like, where, where does our friendship divide from us working together? How can we be honest about that, right? Otherwise it turns into just text messaging that all of a sudden is coaching. What, what's, the, what's the right approach with a friend? So an example, you and I are friends yeah. and then you're help, I'm helping you with my services, right? And how do I go about tell, having that conversation? Because again, it's so awkward. It is. There's no way around yeah. it. Like you, you're friends with them. You care for them. Sure. You want the best for them. And then it's easy for the individual who you want to, you know, charge for your time to be like, hey, I thought we were homies. You know, I thought yeah. there was something big. So what, what's, the, what's the conversation like? What do you do? How do you approach them? Is it a contract? You know what I mean? Is I, would it a definitely phone call? Have, I would definitely have a contract. Um, I start everything with a phone call. I mean, to be honest, you and I have worked together you helped shoot my event that I hosted last April and you were paid for that because myself and the other people involved value you and your services. So it's not even a question. So if we're homies, I want to pay you. If we're homies, I, I want to give you what you deserve. And so I think that the, the difficulty around the conversation is actually just a story that we're telling ourselves and it doesn't need to be a difficult conversation. It's truly just, you're good at what you do. I want to pay you for your time. What would it look like working together? And then let's get a contract from there. And that even goes with barters. People get themselves into weird situations. You should have clear expectations. If nothing else, like in an email, it just, it needs to be in writing. What are you going to give and what am I going to get? What am I going to give and what are you going to get? This business. I love that. Yeah. 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 It's, it's more than transaction. I, I, I sometimes, I dealt with that, especially at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and I still kind of have that boundary where it's like, how am I serving them? You know, because it's evident that we're both in the service business sure. and we want to help people. But at the same time, it's finding that value or the dollar amount that you feel good with yeah. to do that and continue to do it over and over again to pick up those phone calls or answer those emails. Yeah. So you've dealt with, I'm sure, every case in between from people starting their business to people that are in the middle five trying to break that six figure yeah. mark. What would you say has been the one consistent thing with individuals that are breaking from the three, four, five, six figure marks throughout it? Like the thing they all do and that you always tell your own clients to do. Oh God, so many things. Imposter syndrome is throughout the whole journey. So even my coaches who are doing eight figures, like it doesn't leave. When you hit seven and eight figures, you still have imposter syndrome. Um, <laughs> it, what does that mean exactly? Yeah. So you feel like, who am I to do these things? Who, who am I to put this out there? Why are people going to buy from me? There are other people that do it better. There are other people that are more famous or who have more followers or whatever that might look like. That doesn't go away. So I think at the beginning, we sometimes think, a lot of our problems or our fears will all of a sudden dissipate when we hit 10K months, when we hit our first six figures, when we hit our first million. And something that they say, I don't know who they is, but something they say is new levels, new devils. And truly, I've found that every new level I've broken through, it's new devils in a different way, but also the same core stuff comes up. So not believing that you're enough, not knowing what you're doing. Like truly, none of us know what we're doing. We're all just trying. It, the only difference is the people that are what we think are successful is they've just tried more. Truly, it's so cliche, but like my coaches, myself, my peers, we've just tried more. We've tried longer. We've embarrassed ourselves more. We've, you know, had more failures, which are really just lessons. Um, 
we just have tried more. That's, that's it. So I think as you grow the problems, the things that come up for people, it's the same every single time. The same thousand dollar problem is the same 10,000 is the same hundred thousand is the same million. It truly is. It's crazy. It's, it's the holes, the leaks and the challenges in your business are actually the holes, the leaks and the challenges that are going on here. And it's like your personal, it's your personal stuff you have to work through. It's going to be a direct what, reflection. What do you tell people that are dealing with that right now when they constantly question themselves? Mm. We all do it, yeah. right? You say, you know, I, I definitely did it, still do it sometimes. I actually, you know what, thinking about it this morning, I actually, um, I try, I'm trying to figure out a morning routine since of the situation. Sure. And um, I, I'm lucky enough where I'm staying at a friend's apartment where he has a balcony that overlooks the city of Miami. And I got cut up watching this other creator. Yeah. And I was just like, am I doing enough? Am I making enough videos? Yeah. Am I am I targeting the right people? Am I serving enough? I, I tell myself I'm doing a lot, but there are times that we all deal with that where you look at something and you're like, damn, am I there yet? Yeah. Am I, should I be going there yet? What do you tell people on the mindset side of things? How do you get over that hump? Is it something we even ever get over? I don't know that you ever get over it. I think what happens is what I call the comeback, the comeback rate, it just becomes faster. So it's like a muscle. You have to practice it every day. Certain things that I do, you know, people say it all the time, limit your screen time, but create more. How do you, how do you how, what do you do to, what are those things that you do to help that yeah. comeback? So creating more than you're consuming, which is really hard, especially at the beginning, because at the beginning we feel like we don't know what we should be doing. Like you said, that word should is killer. And so we look at other people for inspiration and we look at other people for motivation, which is a terrible idea because <laughs> that is not where you find inspiration or motivation that comes from inside. But we use it as a method. We think it's a tool and a method and usually it spirals us into some sort of a comparison trap, right? So creating before you consume. And that's something that I always, I've been practicing for a while, whether that's putting up a post or not getting on social media, but doing whatever creation I need to do on my computer or maybe it's in a journal. So creating before I consume is huge. It's easier said than done to put your blinders on, but you get to a point where you realize it just doesn't serve you to, to, to look at everybody else and to see what other people are doing. And this kind of trending authenticity that people always talk about, the true like being authentic, it's not, uh, it doesn't always have to be vulnerable, right? It just means that you are truly just speaking what you want, when you want, how you want to, and you're creating what you want, when you want, and what, how you want to. That takes practice. That takes time. And honestly, in addition to having different things that I do to check myself, um, it's a muscle. It's just something that I do every day. I have, I have coaches, Hand, like period, end of story. I always have a coach. I personally won't work with a coach who doesn't have a coach because I think you need to constantly be working on yourself. I have a one-on-one -on -one coach and I'm in a group elite mastermind where I'm with other people that can also, you know, feel what I'm going through and have similarities where we can like-minded people where we can talk about that. And then inside my programs, I have a mindset coach, you know, him, Nick Pags, shout out to Nick. He's incredible. He's part yeah. of my programs because mindset is such a big thing that I have a coach just for that to help my clients through when they feel stuck. I, I love that. And the, the whole mindset, that's the biggest part of the game, right? Yep. It's like a knowing when to step forward, knowing or when to step back. And it sounds like you took in a positive way, a step back towards saying, Hey, I can't be that mindset person. Yep. Let me find someone who I believe is at my level with everything else that I'm doing to promote that and be that one thing. Yeah. How do you as an entrepreneur um, tackle the different hundreds of things that we all do yeah. right do you how, how do you go about that is there any program or your kind of uh self talk that you give yourself with um knowing hey I, i'm not perfect at this maybe i could find someone else to find to fill in that lane yeah like that's something i'm going through personally is that how do you how, taking that confidence in someone else to do something that you know you can be good at yeah. but you could be you're taking away from being great at other things oh my gosh it's so hard so if anyone's watching right now do we have any other recovering perfectionists here that's what i like to call myself a recovering perfectionist give us like a thumbs up in the chat box if that resonates with you control freak type a those are all things that i actually used to pride myself on like in an interview i'm like i am i'm a perfectionist i'm type a those are terrible things to say in an interview um they're not the most endearing qualities right because what that actually means is that we procrastinate a lot that's a blanket statement but generally because we're waiting for things to be perfect or for them to be ready we procrastinate, we put them off, we don't really do. We might start a lot of projects, but not finish them. 
So for me, this started, gosh, I don't know, a, over a decade ago, probably about 15 years ago or so. Um, I actually struggled with an eating disorder for almost a decade. And it was the moment that I cracked when I just, I couldn't do it anymore. Like I was so tired. I had had interventions and that didn't do anything. And I just, I got to a point where I was exhausted with myself. And so I checked myself into an inpatient, uh, an outpatient program. And I truly threw my hands up and I was like, I need help. I can't do this anymore. That was the first experience in my life where I really kind of like gave control to somebody else. And what I did was I checked my ego. Like I put my ego aside. Fast forward about a decade, yeah. I then started working kind of with a coach that I'm actually with now. And he is just a huge advocate of ego. And he talks about ego a lot. And he would always say, this is his quote, Chris Harder, love you to death. He says, ego is your biggest overhead. And like, I want you to listen to that for a second. Ego is your biggest overhead. So when you think that you're too good or good enough, that's, that could kill you. If, if, if you think that you know everything and you don't need to ask a question or you're afraid of asking a question because of your ego, right, that you might not get an answer to that you need, that can literally squash everything for you. So about six, seven years ago, I just started practicing ego, 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 and putting my ego aside. And with business, it turned into hiring a business coach because I realized I didn't know everything because if I did know everything, I would be where I wanted to go. And so- What did you tell, your, what did you tell, tell yourself to hire that business coach? I wasn't where I wanted to be. And I just got to a point again where I was so sick and tired of listening to myself talk about my goals and talk about what I was going to do, but it wasn't happening. If nothing changes, nothing changes, right? So it got to a point where it was obviously I wasn't, I didn't know what I was doing. Clearly I didn't know. I went to school for my doctorate of physical therapy. I knew nothing about business. So when I realized that and I started asking for help and that little bit of help turned into results, it's kind of like confidence. It just piles on after a time. You're like, wait a minute. Now I'm feeling, I'm standing taller. I'm feeling better. I'm getting more results. Right. So for me, it's just been a practice of about five, six years of putting my ego aside. And the interesting thing is as I've scaled, cause I have a team of about 10 right now, um, <laughs> passing something off that you think only you can do, or you think that you do really well, and then seeing someone else do it better it's a, it's an ego check, right? Because at first you get like puffed up. You're like, oh, no way. There's no way you could do that better than me. And then right. you realize, oh my gosh, like how incredible to have the space now to go do something else because you can handle it. Not only can you handle it, you can do it better than I can. And that makes me really proud. So it's just an everyday practice. The more I delegate, the more that I hire people to do things with me and for me, I'm like, wow, this is actually, this is incredible it's so much better than it would have been. I can't do everything. Yeah. I can't do everything. That's ridiculous. How did you, how did you create that extended arm? Did you create protocols, systems? Like, was it every person you brought in, they met with you once a week to go over something? I would say it's similar it's to having like a brick and mortar, right? Like you have the front desk reception person, mm. you teach them everything they need to know. Yeah. How did you go about creating every arm extension? You said 10 people. Yeah. So that means that there's been something that you're doing that's working yeah. that if you've been able to do it 10 times already, yeah. right? It's taken years. You about that? <laughs> it's taken yeah. years. Right, yeah. right. I, 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 yeah, I think it's important that you bring it up, but the idea is that you're doing it, yeah. right? So you are. for me, um, I think growth and scaling are two separate things. So growing is kind of like repeated over and over the process, the system, the reverse engineering, whatever your blueprint or template is, it works. And so you keep loading on clients and they keep getting results and you grow. And then after you've kind of growth, you've done that growth and you have that, then you can work on expansion or scaling, which is now, okay, how can I duplicate that? How do I clone myself essentially? Or how do I clone the person who needs to do that thing? In yeah. doing so, you have to also figure out what are the processes, like you're saying, for those things that I'm going to fill in the gaps. So for me, the way that it started was making a T-chart, like going back to elementary school. I said I was a teacher, right? You make a T-chart, you have hell yes, hell no. Nothing can fall in the middle. There's no black and white in this game. There's no, I mean, there's no gray in this game. It's only black and white. So if it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no. And so sitting down and getting really honest with yourself on a piece of paper and going through all of the things that you do in your business and writing them down either on the hell yes side, I love doing it, or on the hell no side, I don't love doing it. And again, nothing can fall in the middle. If it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no. And when you start to get really clear on, it's not what are you good at, it's what do you enjoy doing? So for me, I'm a creator. So I love like Canva and slideshows and creating and programs and courses and coaching and teaching. I don't love a lot of the admin stuff. In fact, I hate most of the admin stuff, which would be spreadsheets and 
you know, customer service. I like serving my customers, but I don't want to be in emails back and forth dealing with financials and stuff like that, right? So when you get really clear on that, then you decide, okay, who can I plug in to take over some of these tasks? And for me, it just started with like kind of a, a master of all trades, if you will. So finding someone, it could be a VA, so a virtual assistant or a COO or an OBM, they're called online business managers. So someone who can kind of like do a bunch of stuff for you and then literally just doing it, like delegating a task out and trusting that they can handle it and, and micromanaging a little bit, right? To make sure that it's getting done the way that you think it needs to get done, but chances are they probably know a better way. Where do, you, where do you go to find those people, those virtual assistants, yeah. those OBAs as you referred to? Yeah. So virtual assistants and OBMs right now are like everywhere on Facebook. They flood Facebook groups. So if you're in any sort of, um, just off the top of my head, not specific, but uh, freelancing free females or entrepreneurs, New York City, like there are tons of free Facebook groups that you can go into. People are looking for work. And then Upwork and Fiverr are two websites that I've hired out tons of times on Upwork and Fiverr. And then my actual, my executive assistant came from Instagram. I mean, every time I'm hiring someone, I'm, blah, 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 blah. I talk about it on Instagram and I have a thorough application process and interview process, but um, I, I ask my audience because they know me and they know what I'm doing. And generally they're interested in, you know, the stuff that I do and what I offer. So I think dipping into your pool of people is, is a really great idea. Yeah, I think, I think that's great. And it sounds like you're being resourceful, yeah. right? It's, it's knowing, you know, who's watching. And you're creating that, as you said, people know what's going on on your stories. I'm one of those people that watch daily, yeah. you know, yeah. I get my daily dose of Jess. And um, I, I think the greatest thing for me, and I want people to take away from this, is that um, you continuously push yourself to be uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. It sounds like over and over again. I brought up immediately, you responded when I said, hey, you have 10 people. And you're like, it took a long time. And that just meant, that, that clearly just meant that you hit a lot of roadblocks yeah. and that you went through things that you know challenged you what is one story of being challenged that you could share with people when in the moment you're going through you're like why me why me why is it why is this happening to me yeah. but then by the end of it you turned around and you're like hey that's the best thing that could have happened something there's so many things um there's so many things i think one thing for me as a coach because now i coach people on this and i see it happen to everybody is copying and um client poaching and it really stings when it starts to happen and you have peers or friends or you know instagram friends and they're kind of poaching your clients or they're um copying i mean i've had text verbatim copied and pro my program copied and working through the levels of that in both the human experience and then like the actual soul sucking like what is going on and, and understanding really what it looks like and people can say like yeah it's the best form of flattery and they can say all of that but it doesn't stop how badly it like stings and so to sit in those lessons of it actually wasn't mine to begin with none of this none of this information is proprietary unless i mean i certainly have not invented anything new i have not so i learned it from somewhere else from a coach from a podcast from a book from a teacher from years and years and years ago right and so I think um, detachment is something that's been, it's kind of with control, right? But detaching from the outcome, detaching from the course, the program, the, the content, I think is a, is a big lesson for a lot of people because you even hear people say it like, my business is my baby, right? My business is not my baby. It's not, I don't, I don't want it to be. I don't think that's a healthy relationship with my business. Um, I work really hard for my business and right now it is what I do. It's what I live and breathe for the most part. We don't have children anytime, you know, yet. Um, I don't have a dog or anything. So, but it's not my baby. I, I can detach from it. And it's just a theme that I see come up a lot. Not so much at the beginning. The beginning is a lot of comparison for people. But in the middle, when they're doing six figures and they're like really pushing for maybe multiple six, and then their clients start to get results, but maybe also replicate some of what they do we start to get this like ownership where we're like, but that was mine. And it's like, no, it actually wasn't. It actually wasn't. So um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's something that 100%. I see come yeah, up a definitely. lot. I think it just sounds like just dropping the ego and knowing yeah. that, you know, you, you didn't create it. Yeah. This is something that you've been taught and someone that before that has been taught. Yeah. How do you go about um, having those conversations with those people that poach, right? Like we, we deal with that. So like, how, how do you face them? Do you ignore them? 
you block them? Like, what, what is the conversation like? You know, like knowing willingly this person's in your group and you're like, hey, you're doing the same thing I'm doing. You yeah. know, how, how does someone go about that? Having that, I would say, you know, conversation, not yeah. confrontation. Yeah. yeah, I think it depends who it is, right? If it's one of my own clients within my group, poaching within my group, then I would just have a conversation and like, hey, this isn't, like, that's not okay. If you're interested in working with my clients, we can talk about that. I don't want anyone in here to feel that they're being sold to. So if you want to collaborate with them, if you want to talk to them about working with them and I get an affiliate kickback, like we can have a conversation. If it's a friend outside, which has happened, um, that I generally, this is not the right answer, right? But like, I just kind of ignored it and blessed and released and I hope their businesses are doing well. And you know, it's kind of like, you hope that they- I don't, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think it's right for you to say that it's not the right answer. I think the right thing is to say is that that's your answer. Exactly. And that's how you deal with it is that, and it sounds very easy. You said blessed and released. I like that, which is like, you wish them well, yep. but don't call me and ask me how they're doing because I don't know and I'm not paying attention. Yeah, because exactly. you just don't want your attention there, right? Yeah. Your energy towards them, yeah. which I think is great. Yeah. I like that blessed and released. I'm yeah. use that. Oh, and I knew um, a lot. So I don't block people, but I do, I, I mute, I mute, actually, I've publicly said I mute a lot of my peers and friends specifically when I'm launching because the noise, it, it's just, there's too much noise. And so I can love on my friends. I can love on my clients and I can support them fully. And when I'm in launch mode, I can mute them because I don't need to see all of their stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about uh, muting? Because I think that's something so great. I got educated on that when I was listening to a podcast of camera off the top of my but he was saying the same thing which yeah. is the idea of control the noise yeah. control control your surrounding mm -hmm. and I think you touched on that slightly of how I asked you about someone poaching you said hey you spoke to him you took control of your shift yep. like, hey this is my community this is how it's going to work how do you control your noise and doing that what you just referred to as muting yeah so if you're not familiar if you're listening there's a function where you don't unfollow the person but you can just mute them and you have the choice to either mute their stories or their actual Instagram feed, or you can mute both, which just means it won't come up in your scroll. You're still following them and they're not notified. So they didn't find out that you muted them, but you just will not see them in your feed. Um, it's very, very, very helpful. And you can unmute them whenever you want, but I do that. I, I will mute people. Um, it's not so much that they're annoying me. It's they trick. It might trigger me. Right. Or I might lose my creative voice because I start to compare because we're in the same industry or we sell a similar program. So just muting them will keep them kind of out of my, it's that blinders, it's, it's, in, it's intentionally putting blinders on. Um, and same thing goes with just in general, like we don't have cable, I don't watch the news. I, I stay in tune with what's going on. I'm not digging my head in the sand, but I just make sure that I'm very intentional with where my energy is, where your energy goes, you know? So podcasts that I'm listening to, if at any point, it's not a runaway tactic, it's just, this isn't serving me. And so I'm just gonna put it on the back burner, yeah. Same thing with friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, how do you go about managing your schedule and your own time? Yeah. Of how you said, you know, you have so much, right? You have your clients and you want to listen to a podcast. You need to be with your significant other. Yeah. Um, you need me time. Yeah. How do you delegate those time slots? You know, is it scheduled? Do yeah. you have those things? Like, you know, there are people that tell me, um, I think, who was it? I want to say another, you know, another big guy I listened to he, he was talking about how he had time he had frustrating moments with his wife mm -hmm. because he never found time yeah and then he thought to himself the same way I schedule a meeting yep. I should schedule my time with my significant other yeah and it's not that it's a business meeting it's no it's I'm dedicating focusing my yep. attention to that yeah so how do you go about managing your time and scheduling your day yeah I love this and that's, it's so funny because I think when we hear something like that our emotions typically go to shame or or guilt where it's like, I can't believe I have to put my husband in my calendar. That's, it makes me a bad person rather than no, you're taking responsibility. You're taking radical responsibility to make sure that he is, or she is a priority. And so for me, I am a Google calendar fanatic. I actually, I'd be happy to gift it to anybody listening. I have a Google calendar training where I walk you through tips on time blocking, Pomodoro method, batch working, um, little features on Google Calendar that people often don't know about. So I, if it's not on my calendar, it's not happening, period. <laughs> like, and to answer your question of like the me time and everything, it's time blocked in and there are certain things that are non-negotiable. I mean, I get up every day at six. Like I work at home, I work by myself. I could sleep till seven or eight if I wanted to, I don't. <laughs> I get up every day at six. From six to eight, it's, I have a whole morning routine that takes me two hours and then I generally don't start work until 10. 
So I really allow myself four hours in the morning. Um, I've worked up to that. That four hours started as 10 minutes and then grew to 30 and then an hour and then, right? Um, and I think sometimes people, this drives me crazy. People say things like, you know, oh, you're so lucky or it must, must be nice. And it's been years and years and years of hard work and being very dedicated and diligent to those things. And listen, I slip up sometimes. I posted yesterday, I, I didn't work out yesterday. Like, oh my gosh, got me right, like terrible. But I, I, I beat myself up. In the morning, I was beating myself up for not working out. And at the end of the day, yesterday, I just needed to not for myself. And so really listening and tuning into what do I need and what feels good and having certain parameters before and after work. And also understanding that as much as I'm like by the books and calendar, there are seasons. And sometimes those things just have to kind of fall by the wayside. And that's okay. And to not judge yourself for it. Certainly for me, when I'm in launch mode, things get a little crazy, sleep isn't perfectly scheduled you know I, I work more than I would like to um, but I, I also know it's a temporary two-week thing and so then I'll kind of get back to the norm after and getting back to the norm is part of it so it's that whole like I'll start Monday I'll start Monday I'll start Monday that can't happen it's the day it's over we get back to what it was and so just sticking to those routines yeah do you clock out at a certain time or do you uh, base your day off tasks you say, hey, I'm going to hit these tasks, and then once I'm done, and once I do it, I'm done? Or is it more so I'm going to drill myself till 7 p.m. at night, and then I'm done? Yeah. Like, how do you go, being an entrepreneur, you know, managing your time? Yeah. Yeah, I fight, I fight that. Like, last night, perfect example. It was, I told myself, 8, 9 p.m., I'm done. Yeah. Right? And I was hanging out with, you know, I'm lucky enough to be at one of my best friend's homes in Miami. And um, they were, like, watching Netflix, and out of nowhere, I felt inspired to start a, a different website. And so I, I stayed up, I legit, I promise you, I stayed up till like 2 a.m. working yeah. on the website. And so part of me was like, hey, I can't be doing that. But another part of me was like, why not? Yeah. Like, I'm doing something that elevates me. Do you unplug or kind of take that or <laughs> take, I, I'm not unplug because that's a different question. I want to say, do you make a decision of when you cut off? Like when you're like, done for the day? Oh, it depends what you ask. So yes, I don't do, I, I don't necessarily do it by task because I just don't, that doesn't work for me. I do a lot of coaching. So a lot of my day is revolved around coaching calls. And so because those calls are scheduled at certain times, I do keep them within a certain block of time. And I do try to, <laughs> I do try to end my day at a certain time. You know, my husband and I have dinner together and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it's really difficult because I can work on my phone and I can work on my laptop. And at the end of the day, we're sitting on the couch and maybe we're watching Netflix and I decide to pick my phone up and I just, I, yeah. I'm working. And for me, not everyone understands and it sounds crazy, but answering DMs is work, right? And, and that stuff is not stuff that I typically do sitting behind my desk. I, I try not to take, I mean, I don't do anything in the bedroom. Like I won't be on my laptop in bed or anything like that or on my phone, but sitting on the couch watching Netflix is a good time for me to answer DMs. Sitting at my desk doing the tasks, uh, DMs would actually be like a distraction method for me or a procrastination. So it is really hard to clock out. Um, it's really hard to clock out when you enjoy what you do. And I think for me right now, I'm getting a lot of pushback from some of my friends who love me and I appreciate them, but they're like, hey, are you making sure you're taking enough time for yourself? It seems like you're working a lot. You know, make sure you take this time. The universe is telling us to slow crazy, down. You know, crazy enough, that irks me. Yeah, you know. That, <laughs> that it really, really, I, that irks me sometimes. It's like, I, I respect it and yeah. I love it. Yeah. But then there's the other side of it's like, man, like, if you don't get what I'm trying to do, like, don't, ra don't I come know. onto my shit. Like, <laughs> let me do me. Like, yeah. I really have those moments where I'm like, oh, I love them and I respect them, but I'm like, you, you don't get it. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm just trying to do this one thing. And yep. like, I feel like almost in a way, tell me if I'm wrong or if you believe, uh, you know, your opinion, but it's like that saying of sometimes when you're trying to do something so great, people are so uncomfortable and they need to kind of yeah. pull you back from it because they don't even know what's going on or what you're doing. Yeah. And so they're pulling themselves down and they want to bring you down too. You yeah. Know? I mean, That's a lot of times, I think. yeah. And a lot of times we're just, we're mirrors for each other. So you could be reflecting something that's triggering them inside where they don't feel like they're doing enough, you know, um, and we could get like so deep into what the mindset is behind all of it. But at the end of the day, for me right now, I don't have any extra time. So everyone who says they have extra time and they're, you know, learning a new instrument and reading books and stuff like that's awesome. That is so amazing. I am so blessed that I'm busier now than before because I'm in a, I'm in a position where I get to help more people. And that's amazing. And so I'm choosing, I am choosing to run with that. 
and I'm choosing to understand that it's a season and that I will take breaks when I, you know, feel it's the right time. Um, but it's hard when you have open space and I'm just sitting here. I'm like, well, I could just pick up my laptop and do a little bit more work. And so um, it is difficult. It is definitely difficult. Mike and I do have like specific date nights. We do have to put stuff in the calendar to make sure that it happens because days turn into weeks and weeks turn into months. And the next thing you know, you're like, wow, we haven't had like an actual date night in a while. And to be honest, um, he's very involved with his work. A lot of times our dinners are like, all we talk about is business. So we have to be really intentional there too. And it's like, okay, we're not going to talk about that right now. You know? Yeah. How, how do you go about finding that partner that aligns with you? Do you, Is that something you believe in? Or is it more so like you're accepting of seeing someone else that is not into what you do? Yeah, I think you need I to meet like them where they're at. One. Yeah, meet them where yeah. they're at. I mean, I've been fortunate. We've been together long enough that like we've grown together. I, we, I was a phys ed teacher when we started dating. Our lives were very different. We lived in the suburbs in New Jersey. Like we've done a lot of growth over the years together. And we meet each other where we're at. So I tend to go to more events. I've been to, you know, so many personal development events. I am such an avid reader. I'm the one who invests in all of the coaching. He has more of a corporate job and we meet each other where we're at. So I never say to him, you should be doing more. And he never says I should be doing less. And if he wants to read a book, I'll show him my bookshelf. You know, it's like, Hey, I think this is a good one, but I would never push it on him and be like, you have to read this or, you know, why aren't you doing more? we have a very good understanding. I'm very, very lucky. He's, he's incredible. Yeah. I love that. It sounds like a very supportive uh, relationship. He pushed awesome. me to quit. Yeah. He was the one who was like, you need to do this. You're amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. That's cool. Yeah. And this sounds like, you know, and I think that's great because, you know, again, that's referring to the same ideas that we have as entrepreneurs and taking that leap of faith. Right. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like if he pushed you, you trusted in someone that you respect and love. And he's like, Hey, he sees more in you. And so you did it. Yeah. Right. Oh, he, he, and oh, I, he's always seen more than I have. I, I'm like, really? You think so? <laughs> you referred to um, your bookshelf. What are some books that you recommend people like right now? Like, like I know there's, everyone has those. If you're a book reader, an avid book reader, I'm, I'm starting to convey to be that person. Yeah. I had listened to this. So my friend, he's allowing me to stay here. So he didn't have a room. I'm, you know, essentially sleep on the couch. So I'm thankful for it just because I'm in this amazing city of Miami yeah. and I'm able to go outside. So nice. Right? And he has a balcony. And I was like, I don't have a desk space. So I pulled the desk, the, the, the stuff he had in the balcony into the living room. And I created yeah. my own desk. Amazing. First, we got out one book. Right now, there's a stack of six books. Amazing. And so I'm becoming an avid reader myself. So how does someone in the entrepreneurship space or the business space, what are some books that you recommend they should be reading? Yeah. Like, so, so let's say, let's make it easy. We'll say two. And okay. I know that's hard, but right now, just two books. Two books. It's funny. I'm looking right now because this is such a, this is probably one of the most common questions I get of all the things people ask me. They ask about my book collection and what they should be reading. So much so that I put together an entire book list for people. Um, okay. So I think, I believe that money mindset is something that we all need to work on. We all have money stories that we grew up with. Money doesn't grow on trees. It's the root of all evil. Like whatever you kind of learned as a child. And so Secrets of a Millionaire Mind by T. T. Harv Eker is like, you have to read it. Everybody should read it. I read it every single yeah, year. I haven't heard that book. Hold on. Yeah. It's called Secrets of right. a Millionaire Mind. Okay. T. Harv Eker. Um, I read it every single year on New Year's. So does Mike. We both reread it every year. It's a game changer. Just simple, simple concepts, you know. Um, so I believe that that is really important. And then I think for... Oh God, it's like, do we go sales and marketing? Do we go business? Do we go, <laughs> where do we go right now? Well, I would say right now, just due to the conversation we've been having, yeah. I would say business, not, not a mindset. Yeah. I would say business, like business focus. Like, you know, I know a lot of my following people that are yeah. going to be listening since they're trying to grow a team. They're trying to Got it. convert their business to online. So anything business related that you read and you're like, Hey, this is, this tackles on everything from HR to customer service yeah. to. So can I give you two? <laughs> So the one I'm going to no, say, no, no, no. the one I'm going to say is because we all have this mistake that we all make this mistake. So it's called the one thing it's by one thing. Keller and Papasan, I believe. Um, yep. and Found it's it. such a simple concept. Like it's literally do one thing. That's it. But I think we all get caught on this wheel of, mm, we love to check things off. We love to check things off. And so when we chase two rabbits, we catch neither. 
And that's the bit, one of the biggest mistakes I see people make in business when they come into a lot of my courses. It's like, I want to have an online program and I want to have booty bands and I want to sell this and I want to do that. And I'm like, cool. And you want to do retreats and events and you're going to do none of it. So um, <laughs> I think the one thing is really, really important for just understanding like what, like what is the one thing you're going to do tomorrow? Okay. Yeah, we'll one go more. with that. So the next one would be a little bit more like tactical and that would be, it's called Launch. It's by Jeff Walker. And this is just the concept of what does it look to, look like essentially to launch because you're actually always launching. People think like it's launch time. No, no, no. You're actually always launching. So there's a cycle of pre pre launch, pre launch, launch, post launch. Yeah. And understanding like what it means to really like nurture your audience and like take them through the whole cycle. I love that. So I'm just, I want to, how or when do you find time to read? Do you, yeah. are you an audible type of listener? Or is it more so your hardcover sticky notes highlighter all day? <laughs> I am that's, why, that's why I refer to sticky notes. I am definitely a hardcover person. Um, when do I find time? You will never find time. You will not find time anywhere for anything. We all have 24 hours in a day. You don't find it, you make it. So I create time. Like I put time in my schedule to read. And in my two hour kind of morning routine, that's a half hour of it. Uh, in this program that I just put together, like it's literally, it's free. Like I'll go put it in my Instagram bio as soon as we're done so that it's up for people and they can go snag it. It's not only a live book list that I add to all the time, it's like broken into categories. I actually put a training in there on how you can become a better, stronger, faster reader. So tips on almost like speed reading. The thing with reading is a lot of times we do this with everything. We're like, okay, I'm gonna learn an instrument. And on day one, you do three hours of the instrument. And then you, the next day you don't wanna do it again because you've burnt out your willpower. So willpower takes more energy than things that are just already habit. So doing something yeah. new literally takes more brain power. And so if you're new to reading and you go all in one day and you read like 50 pages or you read for an hour, you're not going to want to read again for a week. It's going to burn you out. So starting just really small. And for me, I read by page. I don't go by chapter um, just because sometimes chapters are long and short and weird and whatever. So I just give myself a page limit or a time limit and keep it really simple. 10 pages a day, 365 days a year. Most average books are about two to 300 pages. That's about 30 books in a year. If you do 10 pages a day, that's it. Mm -hmm. Like 10 pages is so digestible. Like it's so easy. Um, but I don't find time. I make time. <laughs> yeah. It's just a non-negotiable. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, thank for you. Your time. Thank you so much for all the knowledge you've dropped. Where can people find you? What's the best outlet or place yeah best place would be instagram i hang out here the most i'm on stories all day just sitting behind my computer um that would be honestly that would be the best place instagram make sure you dm me i talk to everybody i'd love to answer what is you. your handle at jess.glazer g-l-a-z-e-r i'll put it in the chat box and cool. yeah i would love for you guys to come on over if you have any business questions online business anything like that launching and programs, it, uh, you said a link in your bio um I, you referred to the books, but there was something else that you were referring to that's like how to manage oh, the Google calendar. Google. Yeah. yeah, I think um, I want to sign up for that. So I want to <laughs> I want to see where that is. Awesome. Um, Let's uh, I'll put both in my stories as soon as we get done with this. And then I'll, cool. I'll drop it into Instagram as well. Goodbye. Great. What I'll do too. So for people watching, you know, thank you so much for watching on Instagram yeah. live for the repurpose is going on YouTube. So all that info is going to be down low in the description. Amazing. And Jess, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for what you're doing and serving. You know, I'm a big fan of yours. And um, I definitely think we need to talk after this. Yeah. And pick your little brain a little more. I love it. Um, and possibly become a student. But that's a separate conversation. And... <laughs> I would love it. That'd be amazing. Of okay. Course. So Roger, thank, you, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see everybody on here. I didn't say hi to anyone. Hi, guys. Love you guys. Um, <laughs> but yeah, thank you. And I'm excited to see the hair. So make sure you show us. I will. <laughs> Bye. Bye.